How has your vision been? Has it been 2020 in 2020? You know, we Adventists probably dwell on prophecy more than most Christians do. And yet, who of us foresaw the events of the last few months? Of course, we shouldn't use prophecy to foretell the future, but we do have a worldview and a theology that is shaped by the prophets and the prophecies of the past. And we know that there will be coming a time of trouble in the end times, and we do expect the soon second coming of Christ. Amen. Amen. And in the end time events of Matthew 24, pestilence is mentioned. But the end is still to come. It says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but make sure that you are not alarmed. For this must happen, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise up in arms against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. And so I wonder, what is going on? Is this what we're seeing in our world today, the beginning of end time events? Is this what we Adventists have been waiting for? I don't know. How's your vision? Who would have expected a worldwide pandemic in the, in the year 2020? Now, there was lots of experts, epidemiologists, that were warning about the potential of a worldwide pandemic. They all said that it was going to be, it was not a matter of if, just a matter of when. And yet, the world was not ready. Just a few countries who'd been through the SARS epidemic were ready and have done quite well in meeting the challenges of a pandemic. But with travel coming to a halt and populations of the world directed to stay home, and what are we to do? No, our vision is not 2020. We see through a glass darkly, the Bible says. One of my favorite Hawaiian stories takes place back in the old days before the war when Hawaii was just a quiet rural communities. And uh, Howley had traveled around to the other side of the island in his old jalopy, you know, vehicles in Hawaii are in generally bad shape. The salt air just takes all, it just rusts out the metal. The car we had was just a rust bucket by the time we were done with it. And so this guy, he's, his, his car broke down on the other side of the island, and, uh, but he noticed there was a, a little house just down the way, and he stopped in there and noticed that there was a mule in the, in the side yard. And so he thought, well, this is how I'm going to get back home. And he found that the, uh, the gentleman was there on the porch. And uh, he asked him, sir, sir, I need your mule. Would you loan me your mule so I can get back? I have a meeting back at the hotel. I need, I need to use your mule really bad. And uh, he said, well, mister... That mule don't look so good. I don't think you want to take that mule. And what do you mean? He looks fine. I need, I need him really bad. I'll, I'll tell you what. I know it's too much to ask to uh, borrow the mule. Let me buy it from you. No, 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 man. That, that mule, he don't look so good. You don't want to take that mule. Well, finally, he got the price up high enough where the, uh, the Hawaiian guy, he just couldn't resist it. So he said, okay, I'm not going to charge it, but you can take the mule if, that's, if it means that much to you. So off he went, trying to get back around the island. Several hours later, he, the Howley comes back, dragging the mule in tow, and uh, tells, tells the guy, hey, 
That mule is blind. You gave me a blind mule. Mister, I tried to tell you, the mule don't look so good. <laughs> That's kind of the way they speak in Hawaii. And just the same way, we don't look so good. We don't know what's around the next corner. Despite the fact that we have the ability to plan ahead like no other creature, to predict outcomes, to understand cause and effect, to see the future. So I ask you, what is your vision for the rest of the year? Do you have any idea what's around the next corner? Will the pandemic flare up again? It seems like it already might be. Arizona is right now number five on the list of states for an increase in uh, cases. And what else could happen? Is the economy going to crash? How could it not crash with everybody out of work? Will we have more end time events? You know, the pandemic's just one of the things, pestilence that is prophesied to happen in the last days. Is this the last days? Or is this, are we just getting ready for the last days? Are we getting a taste of, I don't know. Will we have civil or unrest? They already do. Is the fear of men's hearts taking hold? Yeah. What is your vision for the days ahead? <clears throat> well, my purpose in talking to you this morning is not to answer these questions. I'm sorry. I've been wearing glasses since the first grade. I don't have very good vision. My vision is not 2020. And I've been wrong most of my life about what to expect in the coming years, and I'm not going to tell you what to do. However, I will take this time as an engineer to tell you about safety margin. <laughs> I tell this to the kids. That it's not good to run things close to the edge. We need to have safety margin. If your car can go 100 miles an hour, you should drive 60. If you tend to get Ill, you should take, do whatever you can to build your immune system. Have a robust safety margin. When we engineers design a bridge, we make it so that it's five times stronger than what it actually needs to be. And still, once in a while, a bridge will fail because we don't understand everything there is to know in this world. And things happen. But I mainly want to talk to you about the subject of risk management. This is what we're dealing with in our world. We have a new risk. How are we to assess what to do about it? And how do we as Adventists manage this new risk and risks in general? How many of you know that the General Conference has a department called Adventist Risk Management? Does any of you are on the mailing list or get those emails? As a Pathfinder director of several years ago at the annual leadership um, seminar, they, uh, we started getting a couple of people, they would fly a couple of people out from Washington, D.C. to put on a class in risk management for all the Pathfinder leaders. And uh, that became quite an eyeful over time. It's just amazing when you start talking about risk, all the possible things that happen, especially when you're dealing with 10 and 12 year olds. Um, <clears throat> Some of the things I've learned, though, about risk is that the safer you try to make something, 
the more risk people will take. The more, the safer you try to make something, the less safe people will be. For instance, they, the statistics say that since they put seatbelts in cars, people drive faster because they feel safer. There's a threshold of risk that we people are comfortable with. And if we feel like we're in a very safe condition, we'll push a little harder on the accelerator. We'll go a little faster in life. We'll take more risk. One of the things I like to do with, with kids, um, I usually wait till they get a little older, but I like to take them rock climbing. Rock climbing is the best exercise or sport for learning to deal with fear and risk because you're actually in a very safe condition you've got a rope it's tied off above you you can only fall maybe a foot there's really almost no way you can hurt yourself and yet when you first start doing that you're scared out of your wits because you're on the side of this mountain it's it's way far enough down to kill you for sure and most people just have real trouble dealing with fear. But I found that if you just spend time and, and learn to get used to it, the risk kind of melts away. You get used to the risk. And uh, after a while, the kids will be dancing up and down the cliff <laughs> to the point where when they get up off the top of the cliff and they unclip the rope, they will still feel like they're safe. And you have to grab them and get them away from the cliff because your emotions will fool you. And fear is definitely one of those emotions that will fool you. And so it's difficult to deal with risk. Did you know that more Accidents happen at, crosswalk, uh, at intersections that have crosswalks because people feel safe and they, they don't, they're not in the moment, they're not watching traffic, they feel like, oh, this is my crosswalk. And they have more accidents at intersections with crosswalks. Another thing I've noticed about safety is that Everybody is talking safety and risk these days. Um, Southwest Airlines has been pummeling me with uh, emails about all the extra precautions they've been taking. And they want to assure everybody that we put your safety as the highest priority as we strap you into an aluminum tube and fly you at 600 miles an hour at 37,000 feet. If you really uh, put safety first, you wouldn't do anything, right? Safety first is a platitude to make us feel safe. Is that really what we want, is to put safety above everything else? Is that the goal of life, to be perfectly safe? But that's how we're dealing with this pandemic. And we should because we don't know what to expect. We don't know how to assess the rest. What's going to happen three months from now? We don't know. The real danger of this pandemic is not that uh, it's causing any overwhelming problems. It's that it could cause overwhelming problems. Geometric progression, if this virus gets loose beyond a certain point, we won't be able to stop it at all. But the reality is, we people live risky lives. We're used to taking risks. 
We take risks all the time. And yet we're used to those risks. It's this new one we're not too sure about. In fact, I bet, is Henry here? Oh, Henry's here. Almost everybody here traveled here this morning in a car, right? Despite the fact that last year there were over 16,000 crashes per day in the United States. Driving a car is tremendously risky, and you all know that, and yet we all do it, right? We're used to that. It's only going to get so bad. If we're just careful, maybe we'll avoid a catastrophe. <clears throat> all right, so let's look at some of the statistical risks that you're all facing in our day and age. The key statistic right now in our world is how many deaths per day is the pandemic causing? Anybody know? Have any, you, a lot of you probably know. It's running right about 5,000 deaths per day. It's holding pretty stable. It was up about 8,000 um, a month and a half ago, and it's come down with, the, with all the lockdown, and it wavers up and down. I've seen days it's as low as 3,200, some days as high as 5,500. So wrap your brain around that, 5,000 people a day. Okay, now how many people normally die per day in the world? You ever look that up? They don't say this on the news every day. They focus on the one unusual death, the celebrity that maybe died. But they never talk about the total risk that you're facing in being a human being in this world. But the current statistics are uh, right around 150,000 people per day die. in the whole world, okay? So that's one out, of, uh, one out of 30 of those is due to the COVID-19. Kind of puts it in perspective. That's still way too high, of course. All right, but let's bring that down. Let's bring that home a little bit more. In the, all the statistics, statistics I'm going to give you are for the United States, and we're going to talk per day just to kind of keep the numbers from being too big. Uh, we're currently having, uh, well, yesterday, in fact, the statistic was 663 deaths due to the virus in the United States. Just yesterday, the official numbers. Um, as opposed to 7,708 deaths of all kinds for the country on an average day. And these statistics are all from the last five years. They're not all from the same year. So that's roughly one-tenth of the deaths that occur in the country are due to the virus. Here in uh, Arizona, we are currently up to 45 per day. And I'm happy to report that in Cottonwood, we're right, uh, yesterday was zero. So we are still in a very rural, uh, less affected area. But keep that number in mind, 663 deaths per day, every day, day after day. It's holding pretty constant. How bad is that compared to what? Um, what's the most, the, the highest cause of death in the United States? Anybody know? It hasn't changed its ranking in years. Right. Heart disease. Heart disease is currently killing 1,774 people a day, about three times what the virus is doing. 
and also cancer. We just heard about our precious conference president. Cancer is uh, also 1,641 deaths per day, about three times what the virus kills. And then it goes way down after that. Respiratory diseases, not including the virus, 438. Stroke, 401 deaths per day in the United States. Alzheimer's, 333. Diabetes, 229. Drug overdoses, 185. Poisoning, 176. Flu and pneumonia, people say that the virus is like the flu. The flu is currently 153 on the average year-round. Deaths per day. Suicide is now on the list of top 10 causes of death at 129 deaths per day. If you add up all the diseases and lump them together, it's about 5,000 people a day die due to disease here in the United States. About 10 times what the virus is taking. Car accidents. Car accidents, we hear a lot about how deadly cars are. That's the thing that probably everybody's life here has been affected by a car accident, right? Somebody in your family, some loved one. Maybe you have suffered serious injury, perhaps a death due to car accidents. Car accidents are only 90 deaths per day. There's more people that get killed by gravity in a fall than by car accidents. Fires are only seven deaths per day. Uh, when we get into things like lightning, you can't even talk about per day. It's only 25 people per year in the United States died because of lightning strikes. All those dangerous extreme sports that you see people taking, you know, talk about taking risks. You ever seen people that do we had, I had a couple hang gliders fly over my house last week, or bungee jumping, or, hang, or um, parachuting, or all kinds of stuff that people got to do because if it's not dangerous, it's not fun, right? <clears throat> Looking for love in all the wrong places. Only 39 people per year die because of extreme sports accidents. And plane crashes, we don't, didn't even have any airliner crashes in the last year. You have to talk about, on a worldwide basis, only 44 deaths per year in the last year worldwide. We have currently 614 cases of coronavirus in Yavapai County. Total, that's the, that's the total amount we have had since the beginning of this, just 614. However, up 46 just in the last day. We've had seven deaths. We have three people in the hospital currently, two over in Prescott, one here in uh, the local hospital. Here in Cottonwood, we've had a total of 87 cases. Amazingly low. However, 14 more just in the last day. So it is on the increase around here. And it's not time to be slacking off. All told, you have a 1 in 45,000 chance of dying today. That's the good. How's that for good news? Okay, and you only have, in your four, four score in 10 years, you only get 25,555 days. So... You know, where do you draw the line on taking risks? 
And that equates to one person in 128, on the average, will die this year. I don't know if we have 128 people here. Well, we usually lose somebody every year, don't we? But we don't lose them due to preventable causes. All right, so to me, here's the bottom line, Jim. <clears throat> 5,000 people a day in this, in this world die. No, I'm saying that wrong. The, the virus is causing about a 10% increase in your average risk of dying. All the risks we, we normally take, all the chances of things that can take our lives, COVID, the COVID-19 is statistically adding about a 10% additional risk. So that kind of puts it in perspective. I can hear my students right now saying, okay, Mr. Greg, that's enough math. And uh, how are we doing on time? I've got a couple of things I want to tell you about at this time that are a little unrelated. How many of you have heard of something called the Kinsa Smart Thermometer? Anybody heard of that? It was on the news last week. It's kind of a new thing. It's a new company that just invented this smart thermometer. It's, it looks like a regular thermometer. You use it normally. And, uh, but it's Bluetooth connected to an app in your cell phone, in your smartphone. And all that data from around the country is aggregated. We've, they've got hundreds of thousands of people that are using this now. And still at this early stage of adoption of this thermometer, this company is nine days ahead of every other authority in predicting hot spots around the country. I think it's a wonderful tool. It doesn't cost much. Look it up online. It's called the Kinsa Smart Thermometer. If we all helped do that, and what it's doing is it's measuring your temperature. You take your temperature every day, and it's reporting the temperature, and it's not giving out your name or anything else. It's all just aggregated data. It does know your location. And if they see in Cottonwood that a whole bunch of people's temperature is, is on the rise, they, through data mining, can figure out where the virus or where the epidemic is, is hitting and do something about it early before. Otherwise, you're waiting till people actually are getting sick and starting to go into the hospital. And this is catching things a lot earlier. The other thing I've been watching is a, a course called MedCram, M-E-D-C-R-A-M. Go get it. It's, it's a free uh, YouTube channel done by a doctor, I don't know how you pronounce his name, Schult, Schult. And uh, I've been watching him for a couple weeks, and he started mentioning about hydrothermal therapy and a few other things. I go, you know what? I wonder if this guy's an Adventist and looked him up and sure enough he is. He comes out of Loma Linda University and this is the most wonderful medical, I mean, you don't have to be, this course is designed for medical people to help keep you uh, continuing education. They've got courses and all kinds of stuff. He is the best teacher, and they're putting a lot of his stuff on the net for free, like they do a course on um, how to run a, a ventilator. So that if you happen to land in the hospital and they're talking about putting you on a ventilator, you will know the right questions to ask. And he's, they made that course available for free. He does a daily uh, update on what's going on. And I tell you, this guy is the best teacher I've ever seen. I really recommend you check out 
the med cram course. They cram the information into you, I guess. One of the things he's promoting is hydrotherapy, that in this time of a respiratory epidemic, if you, there, there have done studies that if you catch this thing early, when you're, before you get to be anywhere near a ventilator, that you can, through hydrotherapy, just like we do with pneumonia and other respiratory diseases, use hot and cold therapy. I don't know, a lot of you know about it. Some of you may not. It's kind of an Adventist thing. It's, they used it back during the days of uh, polio and also the flu influenza in 1918. Hydrotherapy was looked upon as one of the solutions they act, that actually worked during those times. And it's one of the things that can work in this time when there's nothing else medicine can do. Hydrotherapy will, can be a great benefit if you ever get sick. All right, so my point is we live risky lives in a risky world. This new risk doesn't change that much. It's new. We don't know quite how to deal with it. It's an unknown, but still it's just another risk. And how are we Christians supposed to, what, how should we think about that? How far do we go in trying to minimize risk? Do we stop doing everything just because it might be risky? And so it all revolves around the question of what is your goal in life? Is your goal to live life as long as possible? And my dad's 95 and my mom's 91. They're still going, well, I can't say strong, but that's what they're trying to do. God bless them. One of my, uh, my old friends from the old days long ago, he had a saying, he actually put it on a bumper sticker on his car, and I just thought that really expressed his goal in life pretty good. He said, the bumper sticker said, he who dies with the most toys wins. That was his goal in life. <laughs> a lot of things depend on what your goal is in life. When you're, how you make decisions, how you're going to approach risk in life. You know, if, if your goal is to have as much fun as possible, well, you're probably going to be doing some dangerous things and, and willing to accept more risk. But our goal as Christians is to live in eternity, right? To accept the grace of God, to be saved from sin, be converted, and be a glory to God throughout eternity. That's my definition of my goal in life. Justification, sanctification, glorification is the theology that we believe in. And we Adventists call this process sanctification by faith. I call it doing the right things for the right reasons. That's our calling. That's our advantage. That's our message. How to live a better life through knowing the Almighty God. And I ask you, did Paul and the disciples shrink from risk as they spread the gospel around the world? Hello? No. no. That's right. Did the Good Samaritan consider the cost and the risk of caring for an unfortunate traveler? Did Sister White say that the dangers of travel in her day were too great? Or was, it, or was all her ministry going to be too hard on her family? That lady took on tremendous risks. How did she do that? Faith. She had a vision. She was given visions, and she knew that God was at her side. Did Jesus not tell us in the parable of the great feast to not make excuses? Turn with me now to Luke chapter 14. 
You're going to want to look that up and read along because I'm going to paraphrase it. Luke 14, 16. Jesus said to him, A man gave a great supper and invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time to tell those who were invited, Behold, everything is made ready for you. Come. One and all, they began to make excuses. The first said to him, I just bought a field, and I must not risk letting it be unattended. And the second said, I just bought five oxen, and I can't risk to not take care of them. I have to go. And the third said, I just got married, and I can't risk not caring for my wife. And the fourth said, the authorities are telling me I have to stay home. <laughs> what, was, what was the conclusion of the parable? The master of the house was angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the afflicted, the maimed, and the blind. Go to the airwaves. Go to the internet. Go to, go to the people and give them the message. No, our greatest risk is the risk of Laodicea, right? We know that. As Adventists, I am rich and I have acquired great wealth and need of nothing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked, is the message to Laodicea. The Laodicean mindset is to avoid earthly risk. But they take the biggest risk of all and missing the grace of God. As Jesus said, we need to be about our Father's work. While we were yet sinners, he came and died for you. What have we to fear? Yes, be careful. Yes, take all the precautions you can. Yes, abide by the directives of the authorities. Yes, Subscribe to Adventist risk management. Yes, be an example of good living. But be about your Father's work. Life is short. Let God direct your path into some kind of ministry, working for the salvation of souls. And time is short. We need to be about our Father's work. You know, you can do all the right things, but there are risks in life that can still befall you. Kathleen did all the right things, and you guys know what, and yet there was a risk of, of a genetic problem that she had that made it all of, of naught. I got bit by something four years ago and I've been infected by something that's getting pretty debilitating. But all we can do is in faith go forward, take the opportunities that the Lord gives us. Isn't that right? I want to leave you with the story of... Uh, a man named Robin Olds. He was a legendary Air Force fighter pilot. He was first one of the uh, legendary ace pilots in World War II, got to fly the P-51 over Germany. Loved flying. He flew in the Korean War and he flew in the Vietnam War. He loved it so much 
that he refused to become an ace. He wouldn't, he would, instead of shooting down an enemy, he would have his wingmen shoot him down. Because he did, if, he, if he became an ace, they were going to send him home as being too valuable to continue flying. When he was in Vietnam, he re refused to count all his missions because he wanted to stay with his air wing. When they had 100 missions, they were supposed to be sent home. So he'd every night go into the ready room and he'd erase some of his missions. When he finally did get sent home, he had about 150. He just, he just loved flying and uh, refused to get promoted. They finally promoted him to a general when he was too old to fly. But when he came home from Vietnam, um, he received an invitation from President Johnson at the time to come to the White House as this kind of legendary pilot that all the young pilots looked up. By that time, he was in his late 40s, and everybody he flew with was in their 20s and early 30s, and they all looked up to him as being the, the fighter pilot of fighter pilots. And so uh, LGB, LBJ asked him, wanted to know from this man who had been there in person, what could possibly be done to get America out of the war in Vietnam? By that time, it was a big morass and nothing but a problem. And Colonel Olds replied, we just need to win. If you would let us win, we could solve the problem. He believed the Pentagon and the Washington leadership did not have an attitude of wanting to win. And we need to have an attitude of, want, of winning, not to shrink from the fear of risks. We have God on our side. We have an answer to the problems of this old sinful world. John 4.22 tells us that salvation is of the Jews. And we need to be proud of that. We have a solution to the, the sin problem. And we know that the God of creation is more powerful than the powers of destruction. All you have to do is read the back of this book. The God of the Bible, I'll, you know, I'll spoil it for you if you don't know. The God of the Bible wins the great controversy between good and evil. But how many people in this world believe that and live like that? If anyone out there wants to overcome the risks of this world by the Spirit of God, come and join us. I'm inviting you. I know there's a lot of people watching that aren't here. Fill that hole in your heart with the grace of God. Be one of us having the faith of Jesus and preparing for his soon coming. We would love to have you join us. God bless and fear not. We just need to draw nearer to Jesus. Lord, we thank you for being near to us this morning. We pray that you'll be near to us as we leave, as we do our service in this world. Help us to draw on thy strength to overcome the risks and dangers of this old sinful world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.